Hey, welcome to the channel, all about the blue harmonica. Um, so thumbs up and subscribe. Hopefully something for everybody today, uh, whether you're starting out in your first year, you've been playing a while, and then what the people sometimes call intermediate players, several years, or if you've been playing for a lot longer and you're very experienced. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily the amount of time you've been playing, is it? It's how much time you put in, I guess, to make you an experienced player. Um, okay. So what I'm going to talk about today, a few things. One thing is, it's probably difficult if you're in your first year where you're just playing in one position or something like that, but um, you should try and pick an arbitrary note and just play off it. Um, this is what we do as, as saxophonists and, and piano players and guitar players. I've, I've been a saxophonist all my life. Um, th this is the sort of thing you do to get your training up, for being jazz improvising, all the rest of it. Now in blues, similar sort of thing on this, you know, Two easy keys there, but um, and just run around all, all 12. Now you won't do that obviously in the first couple of years you, you, on, on this, but what I'm saying is so that as I'm playing, when I throw my mouth onto it or whatever instrument you're playing, you're, you're, you're into what you're doing so you're, you're hearing the intervals as you go along. Um, it's further on down the road what you, then you, when you're telling yourself what key you're actually in. Okay. That is the way to ear train. That is the way to do it. Okay, I've trained hundreds of people to get, you know, almost relative to perfect pitch. You don't need perfect pitch, of course. Plenty of people with perfect pitch who can't play, and there's plenty of people with relative to pitch who are absolute geniuses. So uh, you know, um, but that's the way to do it. I can assure you. Um, I think I just played a little, little bit off a track at the start. Um, there's a, a type of blues, you've got your normal basic blues um, and you learn your 1-4-5 your, your as people, I don't like that expression 1-4-5, this is what people like to call it, your basic blues idea, uh, and if you're playing a, in a second position blues you'd have your second position, first position, your third position. You? Um, but also, um, I mean I learned to do this when I was about 10 years old on a guitar, I just picked a guitar up and I was playing a basic, very, very basic, bog standard basic blues. And then just realised, uh, I was playing a seventh chord, it wasn't it? Was it a ninth chord? Probably a seventh chord. And just shifting it up a half step. And there you've got that sort of B.B. King style um, sound, you know? Um, and just on most instruments, just shifting up a half step and coming back is no difficulty at all, really. More of the wind players, you have to sort of think it that rather than see it, as you could see it on piano or see it on guitar, you can see it. But um, but you know that's that's something that um, is, is is very common in blues, just shifting up a half step. So if you've got your normal blues, um, you might just want to play second position blues that you've just learnt all through it. That's what sometimes you do in your first year or two, don't you? Um, I coach that sort of thing, but uh, people do that. Or well, you go through the couple of changes. Um, what you've got is, um, I say I learned to do this when I was about 11, just shoot up half step on a guitar or piano, just so you can see it. Um, so if you were in the, if you had a C harmonic in the key of G, second position, and you got your three, uh, couple of changes there into first position and third position, but at, just before you're going into your third position, you're going to here. Which is a tenth position, which on a C harmonica would give you E flat. Now, if you're in your first year of playing, don't worry about this at all. In fact, kind of roll over this bit because um, it's useful, but um, you probably won't be hitting the mark quite yet on this. Um, so, so what I'm suggesting is that tenth position is, is it can be quite a useful one to learn. Um, at the top of the harp, you get a, an E flat bent down on um, eight blow, and then you've got four overblow, one overblow, and everybody has a problem with the overblow. Some people do anyway. I coach quite extensively on this. The one overblow, some I've got some techniques to, to for sustaining on that note, which is that some people find a problem with, and it'll be it's easier on some harps, higher harps and low highs. It's easier on some harps than it is on others. 
like all these things, what I can uh, give you a tip on is it's, it's so important for you to discover. You, you, you go to a coach and they will guide you. Hopefully I come to me, I show you a way of doing something which will facilitate and help you. And then you have to discover for yourself. There isn't really a shortcut on that. And you have to enjoy, you have to enjoy the discovery. And the other thing is practicing. Practicing and learning are two separate things and you don't want to get them, you know, you can practice for eight hours a day on this, eight hours a day for five years and get absolutely nowhere. Or you could practice for a year with the right coach and do very, very well. Because of course you could be practicing uh, doing the same mistakes over and over and over and over and over, couldn't you? Um, and therefore, in terms of improvement, you see very little, if any. Well, there will be some improvement simply because you throw mud at the wall. Um, but it's not the um, it's not the musician's way to learn, really. You know, so um, that's why a coach is, is useful, like myself. Now, I'm going to talk about. Uh, so that's what I'm suggesting there. Tenth position can be useful, right? So if you were playing in third position, for example, okay, then uh, when you get to your five chord, which is which would be A. Okay, then you'd shift up a semitone, so then you'd have an 11th position, which you'll see how it would be B flat. You see what I'm saying? So, and of course, 12th position is very useful. 12th position is very useful for if you're playing in uh, second position G. Dropping down a tone into 12th and back up into 2nd. A lot of nice groovy blues tunes just using a tone like that. And when you're in 3rd, easier. You're going from 3rd position, our C harp, which is D, dropping into 1st position that you'd already know. these harps do that even the new ones they can uh, when you're doing uh, split octaves sometimes they don't always sync nature of them I suppose um, so that's just throwing me a little bit um, so just going down a ton playing in a groove like third position D drop down to C drop back up to D playing second going second to 12 back to second so you're from G down to F back to G so basically your root note would be, in, in second position would be G, then you drop down to say, uh, well, well, up to five draw or two draw full bend, yeah, uh, that way. And if you're in third, you're simple, you're just going from D, drop it into C and then back into, into D. And there are uh, grooves that you'll, do, plenty of stuff uh, with those sort of grooves to it. So um, that's another little idea that you can uh, facilitate your practice. So of course, uh, 12 position, is useful when you're in third position uh, going into first and in, in second position you're going into twelfth so basically what I've said here is that even though we've got these other I, everybody uses the, the the keys around this side that uh, you know twelfth eleventh and tenth are very very useful the only one you probably won't use is the C sharp L and C harp you wouldn't be using sort of eighth position much um, and uh, that sort of that's eighth Ninth, you, you, you use all the other positions, and of course, all the positions around the other side is, is I mentioned in other videos, is because you can access. Uh, you can use all the if you if you just look at it, you can you know in C G D A and you, you, the fragmented chords. You can in most of them you can you, there'll be a point where you can use them, whereas when you're in that other couple of positions I've just mentioned. Um, not so much, you just on single notes, you tend to avoid it. Uh, unless you're just a single note player. Okay, the last thing I want to talk to you about is tone today. Because I've talked about it on other videos, but tone. When you get tone, as in, um, you know, if you're playing saxophones, as I've done for many years, or whatever, as a jazz player, or whatever, or your trumpets, or whatever, you've got to think of the width of sound. It's all about, it's all about the width of sound. This is no different. 
But of course, if you're only a single note player, you want to play with a clean cut sound coming through the mic on this, then uh, that's fine. But you never want to be on a stage with a horn section or anything like that, because you're going to just sound like a gazoo. No matter what you use, no matter how good you are, because of the nature of the thing. Um, and so you really have to operate and work on your sound and, and I'm not on about using um, weird uh, equipment to give you weird quirky electronic sounds, nothing like that at all. But um, that is a, a sticking point with this and you have to be fully aware of it and sometimes the people are not, are not really informed of it, they're not really, or they're not really on it or they try and ignore the fact um, they're looking for the width of sound. Now, to improve your sound, what you should do is you should have a, a set of things in your head. As saxophone players, for example, we spend years with that until we're sorted. Some, oh, sometimes you can get it fairly early, but you usually spend a good 10 or 15 years nailing that down. And as a sax player, I've got sort of five tenor players that lifelong that were sitting in my head, followed with a um, V8 Roadster engine and a, a, a Spitfire um, Merlin engine would you believe in my head and all those sounds culminate so that I get my sound with these five top guys that I hear in my head and it also means that once you've schooled that sound you can operate and somebody says oh can you play like Stan Getz so I can do a little adjustment I could do them a demonstration sounding like Stan Getz or the other upper end of the spectrum I could do a John Coltrane impression of sound but then I can hone this sound. It's a very um, uh, school thing when you when you get into this. If you listen to the trumpet playing of Winton Marsalis, for example, and uh, is an example of a fantastic uh, way, of, um, you know, of, of the Harper Brothers. Lots of you know trumpet players who, who really schooled in their sound, and it, it's it's so so important. Um, now, because the reeds are so thin here. Um, you think you've not got as much way to go and people are, are always so, you got your sort of little Walter chunker chunker chunkers that keep on churning out the same old stuff that people have been doing for 40 50 years it is time to move on you know it is time to break new ground these days uh, you know it's okay if you want to do that but it, you know it's all been done and I always try to encourage people to come forward with new things now on the harmonica for example I have uh, one of the set I have a, a a certain group of things that I have in my head to create my sound when I'm on a big stage. Now, everything that you hear on the tube here um, is going through absolutely nothing of equipment. Absolutely nothing. An amp this big, right, going through that camera, which has got a little inbuilt camera, which is absolutely, and that's the sound that I'm getting. Now, you imagine that you can set that up against some of the people on the tube here, and you imagine what I'm going to sound like when I'm on the stage with the correct valve amp, with the correct PA system, with the correct uh, sound man, or if I've got a chance to sort the sound out for the band, you imagine what that sound will sound like. I'm doing everything on the tube with, you know, uh, basically second class postage stamp equipment. All right, so it's, and the reason I get away with what I can get away with is because I have the sound in my head. And that's the, that's the thing that you really have to work on, even with this thing. And you have to be aware that you're on width of sound within the size of the thing with the reed. So you've really got to be um, mindful of these things, you know. It sounds funny when you're first starting out, of course, you're just throwing air through it. But, you, you know, the, the object of the exercise is you're trying to get this kind of tone. So then you can, and by, by developing that tone then, it means that, you know, Somebody walks into a room who's seen you for the first time, the band's kicking it. If they're thinking of a baby or, or a bus changing gear or a car or an engine, suddenly that's what they believe it is until they actually walk in the room and see it because it can be just about anything it wants to be at that particular point. All right, particularly if people haven't got any preconceived ideas um, and the imagination is left to float. Um, Sometimes, you know, people walk into the room with a couple of pints of alcohol in them, for example, or a couple of G&Ts or a scotch and water, you know, that uh, might facilitate their, uh, their thinking into a little bit of a lackadaisical and then they hear the sound and then, oh, God, you know, and then all these things. 
I'm not advocating that you should go around uh, drinking alcohol, but, uh, but what I'm saying is, it's, it's the idea of the imagination for the brain to, um, to listen and learn and understand sound, really, that uh, people don't spend enough time uh, talking about on that. So, and with, with the harmonica, as I say, I've got these guys that I listen to in my head. Uh, none of them, by the way, are harmonica players. I don't listen to harmonica players for sound at all. So that's a tip there. I don't. Not any. Um, maybe it's where I've come from and what I hear, but I don't, I don't listen to any. And I've also got um, a 1970s uh, 750 Kawasaki spit baffle, baffle two-stroke sound in my head. The two strokes of the Yamahas and the Suzuki, there's two stroke sound in my head, the crackle of the baffle of those bikes and the, particularly Cathy Racer type affairs and the crackle of those two strokes. They're not common these days, everybody's on four strokes of course, but um, it's that crackle sound as I've got the Spitfire sound that I had with the tenor sax um, in amongst the players that I do. This might sound uh, revolutionary and crazy or crazy to some people. But um, this is how you uh, go about developing sound. Okay, so it might be a bit of alignment for others. Others uh, will dismiss it as nonsense. That's fine. I'm just, uh, hopefully one or two will pick up on what I'm saying. And hopefully it will facilitate you and help you on your, uh, on your quest to be a better player. Okay, thumbs up and subscribe. You get me for lessons on Harpo the Heel of Wix. Check out my podcasts. Latest one I've done on Waterloo, which is quite interesting. A lot of things on harmonica, a lot of things on uh, extraterrestrial mysteries, lots of things like that. You get it all off my website, Harper the Wicks. Catch you on the rebound.